You know what kind of plant? Come in, I want all the kids to come up here really fast. All the kids come up here real fast. You can't touch. You can't touch, but you can look at it. All right. Anybody know what kind of plant that is? A plant. It's a succulent. Oh, it's a succulent. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. She got it right. Yeah. All right. It is a, well, it's, yeah, they're succulent plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Plural. I don't know what's succulents, I guess, would be plural. All right. So that's going to be part of the object lesson today. So, cool. Well, we've been in a series in Acts, and I know it's 4th of July weekend, and uh, I hope you guys go out. And we, we live in a blessed nation. Um, I don't always like everything that's happening in our nation, um, but sometimes the freedoms that we appreciate and that we enjoy allow for various opinions, various... Um, whatever the case may be. And so sometimes, um, sometimes that is, you know, there's the good things that happen sometimes, some things that maybe we don't always agree with, right? But we have that free speech and the freedoms that come with that. So um, we live in a great nation. Amen. So we've been in a series in Acts. Acts 1.8 is kind of the key verse there, right? Say it with me if you know it. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so we've seen that as we've gone through the book of Acts. We've seen it go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now we're in that uttermost parts of the world as Paul goes into the Macedonia area and now down to Athens and then eventually to Corinth, and then to, back to Ephesus. So um, within each community, Paul's pattern for, was to go, where did he go first? I should have had this on there. I don't think that's on the sheet, but where did he go? He went to the Jews. He went to the synagogues. In every community that we have record of, that's where he would go first, and then he would kind of wear out his welcome there, and then he would go to the Gentiles, all right, um, and connect with them. And usually he would get con converts from both the Jews and the Gentiles. Now he would, it says that he was called to be a light to the Gentiles, but he always would go to the Jews first in honor of them, that they were God's chosen people initially through Abraham, and so he would go to them first. So we see that pattern in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and now in Athens. So just a little bit about Athens. Ath Athens was the center of Greek culture. Has anybody been to Athens? So that would be on my bucket list to go to Israel and then to go to that Macedonia, Greece area. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Just to go in the footprints of Paul. So it was kind of the Greek, center of Greek culture and the political and intellectual capital of that region of Greece. All right? By Paul's time, the once intellectual center of the ancient world now was in a period of decline. It was a free city, had a famous university, and it tended to be uh, live off of its reputation. Okay, so when Paul arrived, he was not so impressed by the culture, but he was uh, disturbed by and troubled by the evidence of idolatry that he saw present in the city of Athens. So it was home to the Greek god Athena. Okay, so if you watch even some of the Marvel movies, um, some of those they they bring out some of the Greek gods. Okay. Um, Zeus, right? Thor, right? Um, so Athena was the goddess of... Anybody know? Not of love. That, would have been, uh, that was one of the ones in, in uh, Ephesus there. Uh, the goddess of wisdom. The goddess of wisdom. But there was also a temple there. And so Paul's going to preach a message there, a sermon. It's one of his famous sermons in the book of Acts. And it was a, a temple... Uh, dedicated to Ares, um, um, the Romans would call this god Mars, okay, and that was the god of God of War. Yes, God of War. All right, I don't know, several of you got that. So it's also this message is kind of called his Mars Hill um, sermon. So yeah, so we'll be looking at Acts chapter seventeen, sixteen through thirty-four looking at the challenges that accompany the presentation of the gospel in Athens, but I, I think there's some um, things that apply to our, our day and age. And so I have a, a tough crowd today. I have the kids, so I am gonna have, we're going to try and make it a friendly, people, 
kid-friendly today as well. All right? So let's look to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump in. Father, we thank you for this day, dear God. We pray that you would take your word, make it come alive to us. It is the living word of God, and so we invite your Holy Spirit here to come and make it come alive to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, chapter 17, verse 16 is where we're going to jump in. <clears throat> and so just a little bit, Paul's in Berea, and the Bereans were good people, right? Because they studied the Scriptures to see if what Paul said was true, right? So they were honorable. So we did that message, the noble pursuit. Um, but then the Thessalonians come down where they had chased him out of town, and they find out he's in Berea, so then they come down there, stir up the crowd, he ends up leaving. They take him to the coast, and so then he gets on a ship headed to Athens. He arrives in Athens. There's one thing to note, though, here, is that Paul will end up in Athens by himself. Timothy and Silas, are no, they stay in Berea to put some things in order, and then once things were placed in order, then they would make their way to join him in Athens. But Paul would go to Athens all by himself. Just think about that. If that was you, he gets on the ship, He's chased out of town, and now he's going to Athens all by himself. So I think that factors into it. All right, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Okay, so imagine walking through the city, seeing these temples uh, to different various idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue. So he goes first to the synagogue. Both Jews and, Gen- Jews and God-fearing Greeks, so Greek people that... Um, uh, sought were seeking God, and they probably hadn't been circumcised like the Jews, but they were believing Greeks, as well as the marketplace, uh, in the parks place, day by day with those who happened to be there. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. So it is this philosophical center, Athens is, okay? And so um, they began to date, and some of them were asking, what? Is this babbler trying to say, they said of Paul. Now, what you have to know about Paul is that we don't know exactly what Paul looked like, okay? But some historical evidence says that he was short, bald, had a crooked nose or a hooked nose or whatever. Um, He probably wasn't much to look at, all right? And what they're saying is here, he looks like a chicken going around picking feet off the ground, picking up a piece there, picking up a piece there. It is not very complimentary, okay? It is a very derogatory statement that they are making, okay? Um, Others remarked, he is advocating for gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they almost thought that possibly he was talking about two different gods, Jesus and the resurrection. I don't know. Anyway, they took him and brought him to a meeting place called the Areopagus. Say that all together, Areopagus. All right, that's your quiz for the day. Where they said, so this is where the temple to Ares was, Mars Hill. They called it the Aragopagus. There we go. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Verse 20. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Verse 21. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Imagine if that was your job. That's what the men would do. They would gather and they would listen to all the latest ideas that were coming through. Verse 22. Then Paul stood up in the meeting place of the Aragopagus and said, "Um, All right, I need to make sure I'm not getting too far ahead here. All right, I'm going to pause right there. All right. So um, what do we learn in this first part? So he has these uh, philosophers that are asking him. He had the Epicureans and the Stoicism. So we use that term a lot, somebody is Stoic, right? What does that mean that somebody is Stoic? Kind of reserved, logical, right? So the Stoicism is essentially a pantheistic system. So pantheism believes that God is in the trees, He's in the birds, He's in creation. That's where God is, and so they kind of tend to worship those things. God is out there, all right? Um, And so they put priority over logic, over other faculties. All right, so they're very logical, and they saw God as being out there in the trees, the bees, the fields, the ocean, all that type of things. The Epicureans 
had a different system of thought. They asserted that there was no connection between people and the divine. Okay, they weren't denying that there maybe was a God. It just wasn't God was up there, we're down here, we do our thing, God does his own thing. All right? And um, so th- this belief was expressed in a desire to seek contentment and satisfaction, to avoid pain and discomfort. Um, I think the Epicureans were known for saying, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we may die. All right? I don't know if that really captures, but they had that idea of living in the moment. And they didn't really believe in the afterlife and that God could be known. So it is that context that Paul goes into. Very intellectual culture, very reason, logic based. All right. So they bring him to this era, Opagus, this Mars Hill, and he is going to preach and he's going to talk about this unknown God. All right. So that's where we're going to gather our first point here. So let's look at verses 22 through 23. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. And you can maybe even say maybe a little bit superstitious. All right. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Think about that. There's several theories of how they got to that place. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. So they worship this temple, this idol to the unknown God, but they do not know this God. And But Paul says, he's clever, he goes, and that is what I'm going to proclaim to you today. So the Athenians were logical, they were knowledgeable, they had all this reason, but they lacked the knowledge of the one true God. Isn't that interesting? You can have all this knowledge and still not know God. You know anybody like that? You know, maybe it it could even be you. I don't know. Maybe it's somebody watching. For all their religiosity, there, that's, that's a tough word, the Athenians were in reality thoroughly superstitious, superstitious and lacking in knowledge of the one true God. And so Paul begins with his hearer's belief in an impersonal divine being and goes from there to tell them about the living God. So they don't believe that, they maybe believe that there's a God, but he cannot be known. And so Paul is going to dive a little deeper. The point I want us to catch here is that the wisdom of this world can shield us from the knowledge or from knowing the one true God. The wisdom of this world can keep us or shield us from knowing the one true God. I see this in communities and cultures still today. They can be very religious, they can be intellectual, but the one true God remains unknown to them. It happens in our culture, it maybe happens with your next door neighbor. Um, It happens around the world. We see this in Japan, we see this in India. Um, I see this in Europe. Uh, There's so many unreached people groups in our world today. It's not that they lack knowledge, it's that they lack knowledge of the one true God and a relationship with Him. All right? And so as Paul did, we must introduce people to the fact that, hey, there is a, a God and He can be known. You can have a relationship with Him. So our vision is to lead, love, and connect people to a life-changing relationship with Christ. It's not that maybe people have never heard the name Jesus or God, but there's a real good possibility that they do not know Him. Amen? And that's what God calls us to do. And that's what Paul did. I mean, he had a tough crowd that he was standing up before. And he did not have his companions with him to encourage him, to pray with him, and to lift him up. All right, verse 24 through 28, we see our second point. It says the God, he now goes into who this God is, the God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth that does not live in temples made by human hands. He is not served by human hands and that if he needed anything, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Okay? From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this that they would not seek him perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far away from any of us. For in Him we live, we move, and we have our being. And as some of your prophets have said, we are His offspring. So he quotes some of their own 
he quotes some of their own philosophers, all right? Um, to said, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Paul makes the case that through creation, we can know the living God. He gives life to all that we see, and he gives life to us. He's not distant. He's not uninvolved. He gives us breath and life. God's creation is truly incredible, and we can learn more each day. Um, how many enjoy being out in nature? Yep. All right. Um, you know, and that's one of the things I, if I would have not went into ministry, I probably would have went into biology. I was pretty good at it and it came natural to me. But that is one of the things that fascinates me is just to see all the living things, whether it's plants, whether it's animals, stars in the sky, uh, the ocean, whatever the case may be, to see how intelligently everything was designed. It all has a system. It all works. You know, we sometimes mess with that. But it all has a, a system to it. And it's amazing that people can see that. Smart people can see all that, but they don't take the next step. They can worship creation, but they don't worship the Creator. Right? They, can, they, they marvel at all of creation, but they don't take that next step to say, you know what, man, who was the God that did all this? that put everything in place and designed everything. While creation is incredible, we must take that next step. The second principle is God can be known by observing all that He has created. This is what Paul says in Romans, all right, 14 through 23. I'm obligated to both Jew, Greeks and non-Greeks, so the Jews, both to the wise and the foolish. Verse 15, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to those who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And since... What may be known about God is plain to them, really. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what He has made, so that people are without excuse. Paul's saying, you know what? You can look at creation, and that is evidence alone to know that there is a God in heaven that created all things. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, reptiles. Think about that. People created idols. You know, Israel was even guilty of that themselves. They made an idol in the form of a a cow, right? It was a fertility thing. But here you have the God of the universe who created all things. And we try to represent Him by animals and human beings instead of worshiping the Creator that God has made. That God has made all things. So Dan read Psalms 19. Where is that quoted, that first verse? That the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. That's on a national park. Anybody know? It overlooks a vast, beautiful picture. Nobody knows? Where? Close. Arizona. Grand Canyon. Somebody said Grand Canyon. Yep. It's in the Grand Canyon. You look out over this beautiful... At least it was there when we were there. It's been now 12 years ago, maybe. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, I enjoy all that, and to me it just points to our Creator. So I do have this succulent arrangement up here. I got this for Amy for Mother's Day. But I just think they're so cool. And they're made that you water them, you kind of drench them with water, and then you let them dry out. Because they're used to being in the desert, right? And they thrive that way. If you water them too much, they'll croak. But you look at them, and they're just... They're just 
It's kind of like, man, God was so creative. Just think about how God created so many different birds and so many different animals. And we're still discovering things that are in the deep ocean, right? And things that are tiny. And just think about how creative God is and just how God created you and I and the systems that are in place there. A God is truly a marvelous God and He can be known through them. Well, let's look at our final few verses here, 29 to the end of the chapter. It says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should think that the divine being is not like silver, gold or silver or stone, an image that is made by human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge with justice and by the man he appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead, so by Christ. Verse 32, when, he heard about the resurrect, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered and others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So what we don't know is, were they being sincere? Hey, we want to hear you again on this subject. Or it's kind of like very sarcastic. Yeah, we'd like to hear you again on this subject. Not, you know, we, we, we don't know. Um, We can't pick that up. Verse 33, But at that Paul left the council. Some people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus and the member of the Aragopagus and also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. What we do know is that Paul will say in Corinthians, so Paul would go from Athens to Corinth. All right, and... In the, his letter, he did First and Second Corinthians, but in First Corinthians, he would mention in chapter 16, verse 15, that the first converts in that area of Achaia, which would include Athens and Corinth, was a household, the household of Stephanus, which was in Corinth. So while Luke does record some converts there, we are not aware of any churches that started in Athens, where there is one in Corinth, right? So there was, according to what Luke writes here, there was a a few people that were followers of Paul. We don't know if they ever made that leap. Some of them think that the people mentioned here became a bishop and and leaders and stuff. We just, um, there's just not much evidence uh, of what happened there. The final principle is that God remains unknown until we encounter the risen Christ. We have to make that encounter of knowing the risen Christ Those who don't believe have their reasons and their excuses, but no one can, um, you know, nobody can make that person believe. But Paul also makes the statement that we're all without, we're not without excuse because God has revealed himself to us. God remains unknown until we encounter that risen Christ. The sad thing is that Paul preached maybe one of his best messages in Athens, but it probably had the fewest converts of any place that he went to. And I believe it was because in their reason, in their logic, and in their knowledge, they were unable to see the truth that was right before them. And so in conclusion, um, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18-31. And I find it's kind of interesting. So Corinth would be the next place that he would go. So he spends 18 months in Corinth. A church is built there. And now he's writing a letter to Corinth. He has to address some pretty heavy things with the Corinthians. He talks about spiritual gifts. He talks about sins that they needed to be addressed. Um, But this is what he says, verses 18 through 31. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. Okay, isn't that kind of what the Athenians were saying? This is kind of like, oh, Paul, he's a babbler. He, He doesn't know what he's talking about. But to those that are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him. And I think, I think Athens is still in the back of his brain that... He, there was an opportunity for the people to believe, but because of their logic and their wisdom and their knowledge, it prevented them from knowing God. Verse 22, Jews demand signs, 
and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise in human standards. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Not many were influential. And not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Think of the apostles themselves. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world to despise things. And the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become the wisdom of God, wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let no one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, maybe... You know, I hope there's nobody here, but maybe there's somebody here that has their reasons, their excuses, their logic for not knowing God. Uh, my father-in-law did. I've, I've shared that story many times. A very brilliant man, and he was actually going through the priesthood to become a, a priest. But he had, he had questions that he felt like he couldn't answer. And so he went on a journey and eventually came back took place in his faith in Christ, but he had to go through a process. And I, I've come, I've rubbed shoulders to a lot of people, encountered a lot of people that um, the message of the cross sometimes seems like foolishness or it's a stumbling block. But to those who believe it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. And what I do know is that God is not afraid of my questions. He's not afraid of my inquiries, mine or yours. He's able to handle those. If we seek Him, He will be known. He can be known. He wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants to be our Savior, our Lord. He wants to forgive us of our sins. He wants to give us the hope of salvation. But He will not force Himself and so just like the people of Athens, many of them, as far as we know, did not embrace the message that was preached to them. Paul did his best to, to, to share the gospel in a very relevant way, in terms that they could understand. But many of them pushed it aside. And so they'll, they'll be held accountable. Every person will be held accountable for the knowledge that they have. And what's been presented to them when we stand before Christ. And um, don't push him away if that's you this morning. Invite him into your heart and into your life. Make him your Lord and your Savior. Um, experience his grace, his forgiveness, his peace, his healing, what it means to know God as your friend and Lord. Amen? Amen. Would you stand this morning? I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation. And if that's you, but I'm going to encourage all of us to do that. Because some of you were honorary this week. I know it. No. Um, that's a little sarcasm there, just so you know. Um, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of salvation. I just encourage you to pray with uh, together and then just a prayer over you this morning. Let's pray together saying, Dear God, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Come into my heart. Lord God, address any doubt that I may have within my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And Lord God, I ask the blessing over your people. God, that... Um, even in, our, even in knowing God, sometimes there's, there's periods in our life where we wrestle because we don't have the answers and there's things that are unanswered and, and it, 
causes doubts within our own faith. And Lord God, you call us to seek you, to know you. You're the God of all wisdom and all knowledge. And so Lord God, we just come to you this morning and I pray that you would allow us to press in, to seek you. If there are questions that are doubts that God, that you can somehow speak to those. Give us the assurance that we need, the hope that we need. And uh, we'll give you the thanks we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if this song was inspired by the passage that we were studying today, but We can do a lot of things with human wisdom and knowledge. There's a lot of incredible things that we can build. But still that, that mystery of giving life and breath. Only, we can do, only God can do that, right? Only one that um, can give us that life and breath. Father, this morning, go with us. Go with us into our, our 4th of July gatherings with family, with friends. I just pray you're your blessing upon each one. Uh, Keep us safe. um, May we uh, even just be grateful for the land that we live in, the country that we live in, the freedoms that are ours. And uh, go with us, Lord God. and, And also, Lord, let us take the message of hope that you have within us. It's not always received. Some are going to call it foolishness. Some are going to stumble over what we have to say in our faith. But there's others that are going to believe and find the power of God in knowing you as their Lord and their Savior. And so, Lord God, uh, let us be a light to the world around us. And, and Lord, may your face shine upon us and your people. And may you go with your people with grace and mercy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? God bless you this morning. Greet each other as you leave.